Hello and welcome to Business Today Television. I'm Siddharth Zarabi and you're watching Easynomics. On the show with me today is one of India's foremost experts on pensions, Kavim Bhatnagar, a former civil servant, in fact, holds a PhD in pension economics and is someone who has advised many governments about uh, the pension system and what needs to be uh, done. He's worked in many countries in Asia and Africa to develop their pension systems. And the reason, viewers, he's on the show with us today is because there's a debate that's broken out in India about pension, the old pension scheme and the new pension scheme. The difference, at least to those who are uh, government servants, former or serving, would be clear. But for the wider public, the matter has come into stark focus because it's not just Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh, which are ruled by the Congress, which have gone back to the old pension scheme. It's also the Paul Manifesto promise of the Congress party that it will junk the new pension scheme in Gujarat as well as Himachal Pradesh. And this comes at a time when another political party, the Aam Admi Party, has promised to do that in the state that it rules, which is Punjab. Now, if we take all of this into account, the big question really is, is the pension reform that was put in place after many years, and in fact, was ideated by the BJP-led NDA in 2003 and implemented by the Congress-led UPA uh, and came into effect from 2004, January, is that in peril? Because politics uh, and populism at a time when even the Supreme Court is uh, looking into the matter is a significant uh, issue. Let me, in fact, uh, now uh, ask Kavim Bhatnagar about the point. Kavim, but I want you to tell our viewers uh, about why it would be a mistake in your view if... Uh, Indian states were to go back to the old pension scheme. Can you help deconstruct this issue for our viewers? Thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, without getting into the uh, political reverberations, and I really don't think that uh, you know we should get into it. However, what I personally feel is that there is a very strong mismatch between the long-term objectives of the pension system and the short-term political goals of some of the state governments that you've just mentioned about. And the reason is very simple. You know, pension is a very, very long-term product. And you need to look at a much, much longer horizon, maybe 30, 40 years. I mean, if you're 20 years old, maybe it takes about 25, 30 years for you to reach to a level of pensions. But the political myopia that you see here is limited only to a couple of years. So we want some kind of a shortcuts, some kind of, uh, you know, quick wins, which are not possible in uh, case of uh, pension funds. So, you know, it's not uh, economics versus political issue. But if you look at, uh, if I take a step back and look at a more global scenario, it's deep-rooted challenge in the entire world that it is facing today. And one of the reasons why I'm saying so is, that in the old pension system, if you look at where some of the state governments are planning to go back, there is no funding, I repeat, zero funding by anyone, either the government or the civil servants or the employers, employees, as the case may be. And hence, in a very crude manner, I can say that it's a kind of a Ponzi scheme. Why I'm saying is it's a Ponzi scheme is because, you see, when I retire at the age of 60, I have not built up any pension portfolio for myself. Who will pay me the pension? The pension will be paid to me by the cohort of civil servants or employees or taxpayers in the country who are in the age group of 20s and 30s. So they are actually paying their, their taxes and those taxes are being used to pay me pension. And the reason is because I failed to create any kind of a pension fund for myself when I was in the 20s and 30s. So what will happen is, more and more people are joining the cohort of retirees. So, you know, uh, India is a very young country. Still today, India is a very young country. But imagine, it took countries like France, Britain and Germany 120 years to double the population of their senior citizens. We are doing it in two and a half decades, flat two right. and a half to three decades. 
Imagine by mid of this century, let's say 2050, 320 million senior citizens will be there in the country. 320 million senior citizens is, I mean, a population of many countries taken together. And if we right. have not built up any pension, who is going to pay them the allowances in the old age? Their children okay. and their grandchildren. It's a kind of a cross subsidy. So if you look at the old pension system, as I mentioned, there is no funding by anyone. And it's a kind of a very ponzi scheme in a crude okay. manner. Let's, where the let's, current let's, employees... Karim, Karim, yeah. Karim let's, let's, let's pause and break it down into issues deconstructed so that all our viewers can uh, understand this. You've given us the broad picture and the numbers that uh, Mr. Bhatnagar here is telling us viewers. Let me just uh, take you through some of those uh, numbers. At the, at the broadest macro level, the pension bill in the, of the central government in the financial year 2021 was uh, 2 lakh 8473 crore under the new pension scheme and the new pension scheme viewers came into effect in january 2004 for all recruits who joined service post that date the pension bill of states for the same period is 3 lakh 86000 uh, crore those are the broad numbers now Let's look at it from a different perspective, which is a sort of time series uh, data when it comes to pension liabilities. In 1991, the center and the state together had a pension bill of less than 6,400 crore. And when it comes to the year that I just told you, you can do the math. It's obviously closer to 6 lakh crore. You can see the phenomenal expansion. And this is what uh, Kamim Bhatnagar was telling us that India's case is very different. Let's take the state of Gujarat, uh, where a promise has been made. 65 million population, of which only 300,000. And this is another point that uh, uh, our guest just alluded to, which is intergenerational equity. Only 300,000 government employees exist. And that works out to less than 5% of the population, but they are taking 15% of the state's tax revenue as pension. So these are numbers, viewers, that you have to understand that this is not just Congress, BJP or AAP. We are not discussing politics on this show. We are looking at, at the fearful, frightful prospect of the clock being turned back on such a major reform where such massive sums are involved. But in the second question, for our viewers to understand, if the OPS, the old pension scheme, uh, the assured pension scheme was bad, uh, how is the new pension scheme, at least in how it has performed over the years, and what's your own sense about it? You see, uh, there's nothing called bad or good, if I would uh, like to say on to that. The old pension scheme would have been a very good option, provided we had enough of taxpayers to continue paying pensions to the retirees. But now things are changing. Why we had to shift to old from old to the new? And the reason is simple. It's a demographic change. We were heading for a demographic catastrophe because now you have more retirees, more 60 plus people and less of the working age population. So that was the reason why we can call it a kind of a bad situation. Now, this situation was uh, turned through a, a systemic reform in 2004, where the government then switched over from a defined benefit to a defined contribution plan, which basically states that when you join the civil services, you will be contributing for your old age. You will be contributing for your own pension as let's say 10% of your salary will be taken as the contribution for your pension. And the government is willing to put up another 10% on your salary, on your contribution, which is now 14%, not because it's a government, but because the government is the employer for these civil servants. So 10% of you, your 14% of government top up makes it about 24% per month, every month till you retire so if you if you join the civil services pretty early let's say in the year 20 in your 25 or 27 years of age and you retire at 60 62 you have about 35 years of contribution in this time period of contribution 10 percent and 14 24 percent of your salaries so as your salary increases your contribution rate also increases the pension that you would receive at the age of 60 
16 may not, I'm repeating the word, may not be as bountiful as it was in the old pension system. Agreed. It may not be as bountiful, but it may not be as poor or no pension as many of the unions have also been talking. Because you see, you kind of, the kind of replacement rates that you receive at 60, you continue. I mean, there are three age factors which decide your pension. One is age at which you join the pension fund. That means the number of years for which you are contributing. Correct. The rate of return which you receive from the pension uh, funds through the pension funds. And Correct. that rate of return is in the tune of between 10 to 12 percent over the last 15 years, ever since the NPS had started. So we have numbers with ranging between 8 to 12 percent. There are different fund managers. So there are different kind of uh, uh, returns that you are getting. So these returns are pretty decent and these returns are beating the inflation as well. And also you are beating the inflation because your salary and DA is also rising for the employees I'm talking about, for the civil servants. So their contribution is also being added. It's also being inflation linked. Now, what happens? The third factor is the, the amount of pension that you would require at the age of 60. So that would decide as to how much money are you going to get. If you look from that perspective, and if you are smartly invested into, let's say, equities and your risk premium is on the higher, I'm little, using a little technical jargon, then it is possible for you to even generate a bountiful pension, which is the old system is, uh, is able to generate something in the range of 45 to 50 percent. The old pension provides you a replacement rate of 50 percent. Even the new pension can provide in the range of 40 to 50 percent if your returns, rate of returns are pretty high and you join at an early age. Now here, the second part which is missing in the new pension system, which was there in the old pension system, is how you make your inflation meet post-retirement. So in the current old pension system, the civil servant, the pensioners receive a dearness relief every six months, central government and state governments also follow similar kind of uh, structure. So they receive the dearness relief. However, this kind of dearness relief may not be there for the new pension system. So now the new pension system provides for different kind of annuities. Again, there is one issue with the new pension system at the time of exit, which is at 60 plus. So you have to compulsorily annuitize up to 40 percent of your uh, of, of your pension corpus. Now here and globally, let me tell you, the annuities are very conservatively priced. And that is the reason why you receive much lesser the amount of pension than ideally you should have re uh, received. So I think uh, what I would suggest is that instead of going back to the old pension system, instead of going back to the Ponzi scheme, which I called it, or in other words, you have a tiger by your tail, but you can't go back. Really, you cannot go back now. So instead of doing that, you can try to work out some parametric changes and improvements in the new pension system so that people have greater confidence so that people uh, so the uh, so the civil servants have greater confidence in the system and they receive a decent replacement rate when they retire i mean something like systematic what, what, withdrawal what would, plans what, or something what would be the uh, top two uh, reforms or one or two reforms that you would propose at this stage so at the exit stage, I think uh, one reform that the government should look at is instead of annuities, which are conservatively priced, we can look at something like systematic withdrawal plans through a balanced fund. So okay. even uh, uh, because in case of retirees and people 60 plus, you don't want to be invested into equities. So it has to be balanced, but balanced more towards the debt funds instead of uh, uh, equity funds. But yes. There is a cry here as well. I mean, look at the way that the debt markets have gone in the last six months, in the last three months, especially. So those are also some of those issues which we have to uh, face challenges with. The other option that we have also being talked about is inflation linked bond in, 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 in case of uh, uh, government uh, pensions, which can be thought of. I mean, it's just a wishful thinking. Inflation linked bond means providing you, let's say, two basis point over and above, uh, 200 basis point, two percentage points basis over and above the inflation. So that beats you as far as your inflation is concerned. The third option could be that between 60 and 70 years of age, you start receiving less amount of pension. But at 70 plus, when you, are, when you require more higher. of health and other issues, it could be higher. It could be higher. Okay, so there uh, are uh, areas which can be improved upon. Sorry, uh, 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 viewers, this this issue, if we were to take it forward, 
uh, why it is significant is also let's take the example of himachal pradesh and i have these numbers 80% of its revenues its own tax revenues we are not talking about contributions from the center or its share of the pool uh, 80% of its own revenues are going into pensions uh, and you can imagine the, the this number for rajasthan is 30% for chatisgarh is 24% and now if you take a look at the number of employees that are co covered in the central new pension scheme it's 2.3 uh, 3 million in the states the subscribers are at a higher number almost 5.9 million the corporate sector has 1.6 million and the unorganized sector which arguably and ideally should receive much higher support is at around 2.5 million and when this reform came in in 2003 uh, I recall that the BJP-led NDA at that time proposed it and the Congress-led UPA enthusiastically went around the task of implementing it. In 2022, politics seems to have taken over this matter once again. But like Kavim Bhatnagar was explaining, this is not a reform uh, that we should turn the clock back on. There are improvements that are needed. There are tweaks that are needed. After all, it's also uh, quite arguable that there is uh, uh, uncertainty over jobs outside the government sector, at least. Uh, there is inflation, which is cutting into uh, uh, sort of the pensioners' ability to uh, spend on their health care and health care and other liabilities that go up with old age. So perhaps it's time out of this debate uh, that uh, further improvements to the NPS are made rather than a whole-scale junking of this and a return to the old and disastrous ways, and as Kavim Bhatnagar called it, a Ponzi scheme of pensions. Kavim Bhatnagar, thank you very much for your uh, time with us and your patience in explaining uh, the basics of this deeply intricate subject as far as our economy and the fiscal health of both the states and the center is concerned. Thank you very much for your time. Once again, with that, it's a wrap on this episode of Easynomics. We'll be back with more. Stay tuned in. Good night and goodbye. If you like the video, do like, comment, share, and subscribe.